Hi, I'm Kat and today I have for you a true crime case, a word in Romanian and I will also be doing my makeup at the same time. So let's start with the word for today which is UMAN 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 Well done guys, you just said human I have to say that this is the saddest case that I have ever covered, it really really is, although it contains you know a lot of medical terms and I personally find it fascinating from a scientific point of view, it's at the same time just heartbreaking and I really really do hope that you'll stay with me to the end regardless of all the medical terms that I'm going to be using. Jeannie, born in 1957, is the nickname of an American child who was a victim of severe abuse neglect and social isolation. When she was around 20 months old, her father began keeping her in a locked room. During this time, he almost always strapped her into a child's toilet or bound her in a crib with her arms and legs immobilized, denied anyone from interacting with her, gave her almost no stimulation of any kind and left her severely malnourished. The extent of her isolation prevented her from being exposed to any significant amount of speech and as a result she didn't acquire language during her childhood. Her abuse came to the attention of Los Angeles County Child Welfare Authorities in November 1970 when she was 13 years and 7 months old after which she became a ward of the state of California. Psychologists, linguists and other scientists initially focused a lot on Jeannie's case. When they determined that she didn't learn any language, linguists saw Jeannie as giving them an opportunity to gain further insight into the processes controlling language acquisition skills and to test theories and hypotheses identifying critical periods during which humans learn to understand and use language. In other words, scientists saw Jeannie as an opportunity to use her for human experimentation. Throughout the time that scientists studied Jeannie, she made substantial advances in her overall mental and psychological development. Within months, she developed exceptional nonverbal communication skills and gradually learned some basic social skills, but even by the end of their case study, she still exhibited many behavioral traits, characteristics of an unsocialized person. She also continued to learn and use new language skills throughout the time they tested her, but ultimately Jeannie was unable to fully acquire a first language. Authorities initially arranged for Jeannie's admission to the Children's Hospital Los Angeles where a team of physicians and psychologists managed her care for several months. In June 1971, she left the hospital to live with her teacher from the hospital, but a month and a half later, authorities placed her with the family of the scientist heading the research team with whom she lived for almost four years. Soon after turning 18, Jeannie returned to live with her mother, who decided after a few months that she could not care for her. Authorities then moved her into the first of what would become a series of institutions for disabled adults and the people running it cut her off from almost everyone she knew and subjected her to extreme physical and emotional abuse. As a result, her physical and mental health severely deteriorated and her newly acquired language and behavioral skills very rapidly regressed. In January 1978, Jeannie's mother suddenly forbade all scientific observations and testing of Jeannie. Little is known about her circumstances since then. Her current whereabouts are actually uncertain, although she is believed to be living in the care of the state of California. Psychologists and linguists continue to discuss her and there is considerable academic and media interest in her development and the research team's methods. In particular, scientists have actually compared Jeannie to Victor of Aveyron, a 19th century French child who was also the subject of a case study 
in delay psychological development and late language acquisition. Ginny was the last and also second surviving of four children born to parents living in Arcadia, California. Her father worked in a factory as a flight mechanic during World War II and continued in aviation and continued in aviation afterward. And her mother, who was around 20 years younger and from an Oklahoma farming family, came to Southern California as a teenager with family friends fleeing the Dust Bowl. During, the, during her early childhood, Ginny's mother sustained a severe head injury in an accident, giving her lingering neurological damage that caused degenerative vision problems in one eye. Ginny's father mostly grew up in orphanages in the American Pacific Northwest. His father died of a lightning strike and his mother ran a brothel while only very rarely seeing him. Additionally, his mother gave him a feminine first name which made him the target of constant bullying. As a result, he harbored extreme resentment towards his mother during childhood, which Jeannie's brother and the scientists who studied Jeannie believed was the root cause of his future anger problems. When Jeannie's father reached adulthood, he changed, his, he changed his first name to one which was more typically masculine and his mother began to spend as much time with him as she could. He became almost singularly fixated on his mother despite having relentless arguments over her attempts to convince him to adopt a less rigid lifestyle and therefore came to treat all other relationships as secondary at best. Although Ginny's parents initially seemed happy to those who knew them, soon after they married, he prevented his wife from leaving home and beat her with increasing frequency and severity. Her eyesight steadily worsened due to lingering effects from her existing neurological damage, the onset of severe cataracts, and a detached retina in one eye, leaving her progressively more dependent on her husband. Ginny's father disliked children and he wanted none of his own, finding them noisy, but around five years into their marriage, his wife became pregnant. Although he beat his wife throughout the pregnancy and near the end tried to strangle her to death, she gave birth to an apparently healthy daughter. Her father found her cries disturbing and placed her in the garage where she caught pneumonia and died at the age of 10 weeks. Their second child, born around one year later, was a boy who was diagnosed with RH incompatibility who died at two days of age, either from complication of RH incompatibility or from choking on his own mucus. Three years later, they had another son who doctors described as healthy despite also having RH incompatibility. His father forced his wife to keep him quiet, causing significant physical and linguistic developmental delays. When he reached the age of four, his maternal grandmother grew concerned about his development and took over his care for several months and he actually made good progress with her before she eventually returned him to his parents. Jeannie was born about five years after her brother, around the time that her father began to isolate himself and his family from all other people. At birth, Jeannie was in the 50th percentile for weight. The following day, she showed signs of RH incompatibility and required a blood transfusion but had no disease or pathological condition and she was otherwise described as healthy. A medical appointment at three months showed that she was gaining weight normally but found a congenital hip dislocation which required her to wear a highly restrictive fresh calf splint from the age of four and a half to 11 months. The splint caused Jeannie to be late to walk and researchers believed that this led her father to start speculating that she was mentally retarded, which is such a horrible word. As a result, he made a concentrated effort not to talk or pay any attention to her and strongly discouraged his wife and son from doing so as well. There is little information about Jeannie's early life, but available records indicate that for her first months, she displayed relatively normal development. Jeannie's mother later recalled that Jeannie was not a cuddly baby, she didn't babble much and resisted solid food. 
At times, she said that at an unspecified point, Jeannie spoke individual words, although she couldn't remember them, but at other times, she said that Jeannie never had any speech of any kind. Researchers were never able, were never able to determine which was the truth. At the age of 11 months, Jeannie was still in overall good health and had no mental abnormalities, but she fell to the 11th percentile for weight. The people who later studied her believed that this was a sign that she was starting to suffer some degree of malnutrition. When Ginny was 14 months old, she came down with a fever and pneumitis and her parents took her to a, to a pediatrician who hadn't previously seen her. The pediatrician said that although her illness prevented a definitive diagnosis, there was a possibility that she was mentally retarded and that the brain dysfunction Kernicterus might be present, further amplifying her father's conclusion that she was severely retarded. Oh my God, again, that's such a horrible word. Six months later, when Ginny was 20 months old, her paternal grandmother was killed in a hit and run traffic accident. Her death affected Ginny's father far beyond any normal levels of grief. And because his son had been walking with her, he held his son responsible, further heightening his anger. When the truck driver that hit the mom received only a probationary sentence for both manslaughter and, and drunk driving, Ginny's father became delusional with rage. Scientists believe that this event made him feel society failed him and convinced him he would need to protect his family from the outside world, but in doing so, he lacked the self-awareness to recognize the destruction his actions actually caused. Because he believed Jeannie was severely retarded, he thought that she needed him to protect her even further and therefore he decided to hide her existence as much as possible. He immediately quit his job and moved his family into his mother's two-bedroom house where he demanded his late mother's car and bedroom be left completely untouched as shrine to her and further isolated his family. On top of Clark's anger problems, he was abused and mistreated by his own father. After moving, Jeannie's father increasingly confined Jeannie to the second bedroom in the back of the house while the rest of the family slept in the living room. During the daytime, for approximately 13 hours, Jeannie's father tied her to a child's toilet in a makeshift harness which he forced his wife to make. It was designed to function as a straight jacket and while in it, Jeannie wore nothing but a diaper and could only move her extremities. At night, he usually tied her into a sleeping bag and placed her in a crib with a metal screen cover, keeping her arms and legs immobilized and researchers believed that he sometimes left her on the child's toilet overnight. If Jeannie vocalized or made any other noise, her father beat her with a large plank that he kept in her room. To keep her quiet, he bared his teeth and barked and growled at her like a wild dog and grew his fingernails out to scratch her. If he suspected her of doing something he didn't like, he made these noises outside the door and beat her if he believed that she had continued to do it, instilling an extremely intense and persistent fear of cats and dogs in Jeannie. No one knew the exact reason for his dog-like behavior, although at least one scientist speculated he may have viewed himself as a guard dog and he was just acting out the role in a delusional manner. He was, he was out of his mind. As a result, Jeannie learned to make as little sound as possible and to otherwise give no expressions. Jeannie developed a tendency to masturbate in socially inappropriate contexts, which led doctors to seriously consider the possibility that Jeannie's father subjected her to sexual abuse or forced her brother to do so, although they never uncovered any definite evidence. Jeannie's father fed Jeannie as little as possible and he refused to give her solid food, feeding her only baby food, cereal, pablum, an occasional soft-boiled egg and liquids. Her father, her father, or when forced, her brother spooned food into her mouth as quickly as possible and if she choked or could not swallow fast enough, 
the person feeding her rubbed her face in her food. These were normally the only times he allowed his wife to be with Jeannie, although she could not feed Jeannie herself. Jeannie's mother claimed her husband always fed Jeannie three times a day, but also said that Jeannie sometimes risked a beating by making noise when hungry, leading researchers to believe he often refused to feed her. In early 1972, Jeannie's mother told, research, told researchers that whenever possible, at around 11 at night, she would try to give Jeannie additional food, causing Jeannie to develop an abnormal sleep pattern in which she slept from 7 to 11 p.m., woke up for a few minutes and fell back asleep for an additional six and a half hours. This sleep pattern continued for quite a few months after she began to receive medical attention. Jeannie's father had an extremely low tolerance for noise to the point of refusing to have a working television or radio in the house. He almost never allowed his wife or son to talk and viciously beat them if they did so without permission, particularly forbidding them to speak to or around Jeannie. Any conversation between them was therefore very quiet and out of Jeannie's earshot, preventing her from hearing any meaningful amount of language. Jeannie's father kept Jeannie's room extremely dark and the only available stimuli were the crib, the chair, curtains on each of the windows, three pieces of furniture and two plastic rain jackets hanging on the wall. On rare occasions, he allowed Jeannie to play with plastic food containers, old spools of thread, TV guides with many of the illustrations cut out and the raincoats. The room had two almost entirely blacked out windows, one which her father left slightly open. Although the house was well away from the street and from other houses, she could see the side of a neighboring house and a few inches of the sky and occasionally heard environmental sounds or a neighboring child practicing the piano. Throughout this time, Jeannie's father almost never allowed anyone else to leave the house, only allowing his son to go to and from school and required him to prove his identity through various means before entering the house. And to discourage disobedience, he frequently sat in the living room with a shotgun in his lap. He didn't allow anyone else in or near the house and he kept his gun nearby in case someone did come to the house. No one in the neighborhood knew about the abuse Jeannie's father carried out on his family or was aware that Jeannie's parents ever had a child besides their son. Throughout this time, Jeannie's father kept detailed notes chronicling his mistreatment of his family and his effort to conceal it. Jeannie's mother was passive by nature and almost completely blind throughout this time. Her husband continued to beat her and threatened to kill her if she even tried to contact her parents, close friends who live nearby or the police. Jeannie's father also forced his son into silence, giving him instructions on how to keep his father's actions secret and beating him with increasing frequency and severity and as he got older, his father forced him to carry, out, to carry out progressively more abuse of Jeannie. He felt completely powerless to do anything to stop it and feared severe retribution for trying to intervene and on multiple occasions tried to run away from the house. Jeannie's father was convinced Jeannie would die by age 12 and promised that if she survived past that age, he would allow his wife to seek outside assistance for her, but he actually changed his mind when Jeannie turned 12 years old and her mother took no action for another year and a half. In October 1970, when Jeannie was around 13 years and 6 months old, Jeannie's parents had a violent argument in which her mother threatened to walk out if she could not call her own parents. Her husband eventually gave in and uh, later that day she left with Jeannie and he was out of the house and went to her parents in Monterey Park. Jeannie's brother by then, 18 years old, had already run away from home and was living with friends. Around three weeks later, on 4th of November, Jeannie's mother decided to apply for disability benefits for the blind in nearby Temple City, California and brought Jeannie with her 
but on account of her near blindness, Ginny's mother accidentally entered the general social services office next door. The social worker who greeted them instantly sensed that something was wrong when she saw Ginny and she was shocked to learn her true age. Having estimated from her appearance and demeanor that she was around six or seven and possibly autistic. And after she and her supervisor questioned Ginny's mother and confirmed Ginny's age, they immediately contacted the police. Ginny's parents were arrested and Ginny became a ward of the court and due to her physical condition and near total unsocialized state, a court order was immediately issued for Ginny to be taken to the Children's Hospital Los Angeles. After Ginny's admission to Children's Hospital, David Riegler, a therapist and University of Southern California psychology professor who was the chief psychologist at the hospital and Howard Hansen, then the head of the psychiatry division and an early expert on child abuse, took direct control of Ginny's care. The following day, they assigned physician James Kent, another early advocate for child abuse awareness, to conduct the first examinations of Ginny. Most of the information doctors received on Ginny's early life came from the police investigation into Ginny's parents. Even after its conclusion, there was a large number of unresolved questions about Ginny's childhood that further research never answered. News of Ginny reached major media outlets on November 17, receiving a great deal of local and national attention, and the one photograph authorities released of Ginny significantly fueled public interest in her. Although Ginny's father refused to speak to the police or the media, large crowds went to try and see him, which he found extremely difficult to handle. On November 20th, the morning before a scheduled court appearance on child abuse charges, he actually killed himself by gunshot. Police found two suicide notes, one intended for his son, which in part said, be a good boy, I love you, and one directed at the police. It's not know exactly which note contained the declaration, the world will never understand. After Ginny's father committed suicide, authorities and hospital staff exclusively focused on Ginny and her mother. Years later, Ginny's brother said that his mother soon began dedicating all of her love and attention to Ginny, after which he left the Los Angeles area. At the request of Hanson, attorney John Minor, an acquaintance of Hanson, represented Ginny's mother in court. She told the court that the beatings from her husband and her near total blindness had left her unable to protect her children. Charges against her were dropped and she received counseling from Children's Hospital. Hansen was her therapist's direct supervisor. James Kent stated that his initial examinations of Jeannie revealed by far the most severe case of child abuse he would ever encounter and came away extremely pessimistic about her diagnosis. Ginny was extremely pale and grossly malnourished, standing 4 feet 6 inches tall or 1.37 meters and weighing only 59 pounds or 27 kilograms. She had two nearly full sets of teeth in her mouth and a distended abdomen. The restraining harness her father used had caused a thick callus and heavy black bruising on her buttocks, which took several weeks to heal. A series of x-rays found that Ginny had moderate coxa valga in both hips and an undersized ribcage, and doctors determined her bone age to be that of an 11-year-old. Despite early tests confirming she had normal vision in both eyes, she could not focus them on anything more than 10 feet or 3 meters away, corresponding to the dimensions of the room that her father kept her in. Ginny's gross motor skills were extremely weak. She could neither stand up straight nor fully straighten any of her limbs and she had very little endurance. Her movements were very hesitant and unsteady and her characteristic bunny walk in which she held her hands in front of her like paws while, while walking suggested extreme difficulty with sensory processing 
and an inability to integrate visual and tactile information. Kent was somehow surprised to find her fine motor skills were significantly better determining they were at approximately the level of a two-year-old. Ginny couldn't chew and she had very severe dysphagia, totally incapable of swallowing solid or even soft food and barely able to swallow liquids. When eating, she held anything she could not swallow in her mouth until her saliva broke it down and if this took too long she spat it out and mashed it with her fingers. She was also completely incontinent and didn't respond to extreme temperatures. Mm -hmm. Doctors found it extremely difficult to test or estimate Jeannie's mental age or any of her cognitive abilities but on two attempts they found that Jeannie scored at the, at the level of a 13 month old. To the surprise of doctors, she was intensely interested in exploring new environmental stimuli, although objects seemed to intrigue her much more than people. She seemed especially curious about unfamiliar sounds and Kent noticed that she was very intently searching for their sources. Doctors noticed her extreme fear of cats and dogs very early during her stay but they initially believed that this was because of her being incapable of rational thinking. They didn't find its actual origin until years later. From the start, Ginny showed interest in many hospital staff members, often approaching and walking with complete strangers, but Kent said that she didn't really seem to distinguish between people and showed no signs of attachment to anyone, including her mother and brother. At first, she wouldn't allow anyone to touch her, quickly shying away from any physical contact. And while she sat on her mother's lap when requested, she was very tense and she got up as quickly as possible. Hospital staff wrote that her mother seemed entirely oblivious to Ginny's emotions and actions. Ginny's behavior was typically highly antisocial and proved extremely, extremely difficult for others to control. Regardless of where she was, she constantly salivated and she spat and continuously sniffed and blew her nose on anything that happened to be nearby. She had no sense of personal property frequently pointing to or taking something that she wanted from someone else or situational awareness. She acted on impulse irrespective of the setting and she frequently engaged in open masturbation and would sometimes attempt to involve older men to do it. From the start, Ginny showed a small amount of responsiveness to nonverbal information, including gestures and, faci and facial expressions from other people, and made reasonably good eye contact. However, her demeanor was completely devoid of any expressions or discernible body language, and she could only nonverbally get across a few very basic needs. She clearly distinguished speaking from other sounds but she remained almost completely silent and unresponsive to speech and any responses she gave were to accompanying nonverbal signals. When uh, upset, Ginny would wildly attack herself and while doing so she remained completely expressionless and never cried or vocalized. Some accounts said that she could not cry at all. To make noise, she would push chairs or other similar objects. Her outbursts initially happened very often and had no apparent trigger. Kent wrote that she never tried to indicate the source of her anger and continued until someone diverted her attention or she physically tired herself out, at which point she would again become silent and non-expressive. Linguists later discerned that in January 1971, Ginny showed an understanding of only her own name, the names of a few others, and about 15 to 20 words. And her active vocabulary at the time consisted of two phrases, stop it and no more. They could not determine the extent of her expressive or receptive vocabulary at any point before January 1971. And so they didn't know whether she had acquired any or all of these words during the previous two months. 
After observing Ginny for some time, they concluded that she was not selectively mute and tests found no, psycho no, no physiological or psychological explanation for her lack of language. Because her existing medical records also contain no clear indication of mental disabilities, researchers determined that due to her extreme isolation and lack of exposure to language during childhood, she had not acquired or learned a first language. Within a month after Ginny's admission to Children's Hospital, Jay Shirley, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, at the University of Oklahoma and a specialist in extreme social isolation took an interest in Ginny's case. Shirley noted that Ginny's was the most severe case of isolation he had, have, he had ever studied or heard about, which he maintained more than 20 years later. Over the next year and a half, he came on three-day visits to conduct daily observations and to carry out a sleep study hoping to determine if Jeannie was autistic, whether or not she has sustained any brain damage, and whether or not she was born mentally disabled. I'm not going to say that word again because it just sounds really bad. Shirley concluded that she wasn't autistic, with which later researchers agreed. He noticed that she had a high level of emotional disturbance, but wrote that her eagerness for new stimuli and lack of behavioral defense mechanisms were uncharacteristic of autism. Shirley found no signs of brain damage, but he observed a few persistent abnormalities in Ginny's sleep, including a significantly reduced amount of REM sleep with a much larger than average variance in duration and an unusually high number of sleep spindles, which are the bursts of rhythmic or repetitive neural activity. He eventually concluded that Jeannie had been mentally disabled from birth, specifically citing her significantly elevated number of sleep spindles, as these are characteristic of people born severely disabled. The other scientists following the case remain divided on this issue. Much later, for example, Susan Curtis argued that even though Jeannie clearly had serious emotional difficulties, she couldn't have been mentally disabled. She pointed out that Jeannie made a year's developmental progress for every calendar year after her rescue, which would not be expected if her condition was congenital, and that some aspects of language Jeannie acquired were very unusual, in the speech of mentally disabled people. She instead maintained that Jeannie was born with at least average intelligence and that the abuse and isolation of her childhood left her functionally retarded. I hate this word. In his first meeting with Jeannie, James Kent initially observed no reaction from her but eventually drew a small amount of nonverbal and verbal responsiveness with a small puppet. Playing with this and similar puppets quickly became Jeannie's favorite activity and apart from her tantrums accounted for most of the few times she expressed any emotion during the early part of her stay. Within a few days, she started learning to dress herself and began voluntarily using the toilet, but she continued to suffer from nighttime and, and daytime incontinence, which only slowly improved. Kent quickly realized there would be a large number of people working with Jeannie and he was concerned that she would not learn to form a normal relationship unless somebody was a steady presence in her life so he decided to accompany her on walks and to all of her appointments. Ginny quickly began growing and putting on weight and steadily became more confident in her movements. By December, she had good eye-hand coordination and was much better at focusing her eyes. She rapidly developed a sense of possession. For reasons doctors didn't determine, she would hold objects to which she took a liking and became extremely upset if someone touched or moved anything that she collected. She took all kinds of items, but particularly 
was looking for colorful plastic objects which doctor believed was which doctors believed was due to these having been the items that she had access to as a child and she didn't really seem to care if they were toys or just ordinary containers but especially sought out beach pails during the first few months of her stay giving her one of these objects could bring her out of a tantrum after a few weeks Jeannie became much more responsive to other people and shortly afterwards she began paying attention to people speaking but at first she remained mostly without any expression and it was unclear if she responded more to verbal or non-verbal stimuli. Shortly afterwards she showed clear responses to non-verbal signals and her non-verbal communication skills quickly became exceptional. A month into her stay, Jeannie started becoming sociable with familiar adults, first with Kent and soon after with, others hospi with other hospital staff. She was clearly happy when someone she knew visited and she sometimes worked very hard to get a person to stay, expressing disappointment if she failed. For no particular reason, her greetings were far more energetic than her relatively mild unhappiness when people left. After the state dropped charges against Jeannie's mother, she began visiting Jeannie twice a week and over the course of a few months, they steadily grew better at interacting with each other. Around the same time, doctors noticed that Jeannie took pleasure in intentionally dropping or destroying small objects and enjoyed watching someone else do the same to something she had been playing with. Kent wrote that she did the same series of actions several times over and that it appeared to ease some kind of an internal tension for her and therefore believed she did this to gain control of traumatic childhood experiences. She also showed a deep fascination with classical piano music played in front of her, which researchers believed was because she could hear some piano music during her childhood. She didn't have the same reaction to recordings and if someone played anything other than classical music, she would change the sheet music to a book which she knew had pieces that she liked. By December 1970, Kent and the other hospital staff working with Jeannie saw her as a potential case study subject. That month, David Riegler obtained a small grant from the National Institute of Mental Health, the NIMH, to do preliminary studies on her and began organizing a research team to submit a larger request. In January 1971, doctors administered a Giselle developmental evaluation and found Jeannie to be at the developmental level of a 1 to 3 year old, noting she already showed substantial developmental disparities. The following month, psychologists Jack Block and Jean Block evaluated Jeannie and her scores ranged from below a 2 to 3 year old level to, on a few components, a normal 12 to 13 year old level. Around the same time, doctors noted that she was very interested in people speaking and that she attempted to mimic some speech sounds. By April and May 1971, Jeannie's scores on the lighter International Performance Scale test had dramatically increased with her overall mental age at the level of a typical four year, nine month old, but on individual components, she still showed a very high level of scatter. Her progress with language accelerated and the doctors noticed that the words she used indicated a fairly advanced mental categorization of objects and situations and focused on objective properties to a degree not normally found in children. Around that time, when a minor earthquake struck Los Angeles, she ran frightened into the kitchen and rapidly verbalized to some of the hospital cooks she had befriended, marking the first time that she actually looked for comfort from another person and the first time she was able to say this verbally. However, she still had a hard time being in large crowds of people. At her birthday party, she became so anxious at all the guest presents that she had to go outside with, with Riegler to calm down. 
During the later part of Jeannie's stay at the hospital, she also started engaging in physical play with adults and eventually began to enjoy giving and receiving hugs. She continued to exhibit frustration and have tantrums, but in response to situations that would have elicited similar reactions in most young children. And she could sulk for a long time despite receiving an object she liked. In April 1971, to the great surprise of doctors, she actually began attacking another girl because she felt she owned the hospital dress that the other girl had on. This was both her first signs of a sense of possession over items that she believed were hers, but was otherwise impartial toward, towards and the first time she directed her anger outwards, but she didn't entirely stop harming herself when angry. Beginning in January 1971, scientists conducted a series of neuro-linguistic tests on Jeannie to determine and monitor the course and extent of her mental development, making her the first language-deprived child to undergo any detailed study of her brain. Jeannie's entire brain was physically intact and Shirley's sleep studies found sleep patterns typical of a left hemisphere dominant person, leading scientists to believe she was most likely right-handed. Over the following years, multiple tests of her handedness supported this conclusion, as did observations of her in everyday situations. Based on their early tests, doctors suspected Ginny's brain was extremely right hemisphere dominant. In early March of that year, neuroscientists Ursula Bellucci and Edward Klima came from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies to administer their own series of brain exams on Ginny. Audiometry tests confirmed that she had normal hearing in both ears, but on a series of dichotic listening tests, Bellucci and Klima found that she identified language sounds with 100% accuracy, accuracy in her left ear while correctly answering at only a chance level in her right ear. Such an extreme level of asymmetry on this test had previously only been documented in patients with either split brain or who had undergone a hemispherectomy as an adult. When they gave her monaural tests for both language and non-language sounds, she answered with 100 percent with accuracy in both ears, which was normal. On non-language dichotic listening tests, she showed a slight preference for identifying non-language sounds in her left ear, which was typical for a right-handed person and helped rule out the possibility of her brain only being reversed in dominance for language. Based on these results, Bellucci and Klima believed that Jeannie had been developing as a typical right-handed person until the time her father began isolating her. They attributed the imbalance between Jeannie's hemispheres to the fact that Jeannie's sensory input as a child was almost exclusively visual and tactile, stimulating functions which are predominantly controlled in the right hemisphere of a right-handed person and although this input had been extremely minimal, it was enough to cause their lateralization to the right hemisphere. Because Ginny did not have significant linguistic input during her childhood, they concluded that her left hemisphere underwent no, spe no specialization whatsoever, so her language functions never lateralized to it. Since G so basically because she didn't use her left hemisphere, she couldn't learn anything with the left hemisphere. Since Jeannie accurately distinguished speech sounds with her right hemisphere, they thought her language functions had lateralized there instead. At the time of Jeannie's admission to Children's Hospital, there was, there was wide discussion in both lay and academic circles about the hypothesis of Noam Chomsky, who had first suggested that language was innate to humans and distinguishes humans from all other animals, and Eric Lenneberg, who in 1967 hypothesized that humans have a critical period for language acquisition and defined its end as the onset of puberty. Despite the interest in this hypothesis, before Jeannie's discovery, there had been no way to test them. Even though ancient and medieval texts made several 
references to language deprivation experiments, modern researchers label such ideas the forbidden experiment impossible to carry out for ethical reasons. Coincidentally, the Franois Truffaut film The Wild Child, which chronicled the life of Victor of Aveyron in the years immediately after his discovery, and the efforts of Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard to teach him language and integrate him into society, also premiered in the United States only a week after Ginny's rescue. The movie was a major success and further heightened public interest in cases of children subjected to extreme abuse or isolation. Prompted by this coincidence of timing, David Riegler led a team of scientists who sought and obtained a three-year grant from the NIMH to study Ginny in May 1971. At the suggestion of Jean Butler, Ginny's special education teacher at the hospital, they screamed the wild child during their first meeting and the scientists later said this had an immediate and profound impact on all of them. The huge varieties of suggestions for how to work with Ginny made it extremely difficult for researchers to give the proposal a coherent direction. To the surprise of several scientists involved in the grant meetings, Riegler decided the primary focus of the study would be to test Chomsky and Lennerberg's hypotheses and selected UCLA linguistics professor Victoria Fromkin to head linguistic evaluation. The research team also planned to continue periodic evaluations of Ginny's psychological development in more aspects of her life. From the time of her admission to Children's Hospital, researchers had tried to keep her identity a secret and it was around this time that they adopted the name Ginny for her, referencing similarities between a Ginny coming out of a lamp without having a childhood and Ginny's sudden emergence into society past childhood. Soon after the grant was accepted, in late May 1971, Susan Curtis began her work on Ginny's case as a graduate student in linguistics under Victoria Fromkin. And for the remainder of Ginny's stay at Children's Hospital, Curtis met with Ginny almost every day. Curtis quickly recognized Ginny's powerful nonverbal communication abilities, writing that complete strangers would frequently buy something for her because they sensed that she wanted it and that these gifts were always the types of objects that she most enjoyed. Curtis concluded that Ginny learned a, signi a significant amount of language, but it was not yet at a usefully testable level, so she decided to dedicate the next few months to getting to know Ginny and gaining her friendship. Over the next few months, she and Ginny very quickly bonded with each other. At around the same time, Curtis began her work. Doctors re-evaluated Ginny on the lighter scale and measured her on the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale, which placed her estimated mental age between a 5 and 8 year old with a very high degree of scatter. Doctors believed that Ginny learned to use her gestalt perception to determine the number of objects in a group and by the start of the case study she could accurately discern the correct number of up to seven objects via subitization, which I have no idea what it means. Child psychologist David Elkind, who was involved in the grant meetings, evaluated Ginny in May 1971 and reported that she was in the concrete operational stage of development, noting that she understood object permanence and could engage in deferred imitation. Ginny's physical health also continued to improve, and by this time her endurance dramatically increased. Her social behavior was still highly abnormal and doctors were especially concerned that she almost never interacted with people her age, but evaluations from the time expressed some optimism about her prognosis. In June 1971, Jean Butler obtained permission to take Jeannie on day trips to her home in country, in country Club Park, Los Angeles. Near the end of that month, after one of these trips, Butler told the hospital that she might have contracted rubella, to which Jeannie would have been exposed. Hospital staff were reluctant to give foster custody to Butler and were very skeptical of her story, strongly suspecting that she made up the story as part of a bid 
to take over as Jeannie's guardian and primary caretaker, but decided that placing Jeannie in an isolation ward at the hospital could potentially be highly damaging to her social and psychological development, so they agreed to temporarily quarantine her in Butler's home. Butler, who didn't have any children, she was unmarried and at the time living alone, later on petitioned for foster custody of Jeannie and even though the hospital's objections authorities extended Jeannie's stay, they were still considering the matter. Soon after moving in with Butler, Jeannie started showing the first signs of reaching puberty, marking a dramatic improvement in her overall physical health and definitively putting her past Lenneberg's proposed critical period for language acquisition. Butler continued to observe and document Jeannie's hoarding, in particular noting that Jeannie collected and kept dozens of containers of liquid in her room. Although she couldn't really understand the reason for Ginny's intense fear of cats and dogs, after witnessing it firsthand, Butler and the man she was dating, who was a retired University of Southern California professor and psychologist, tried to help her overcome this fear by watching episodes of the television series Lassie with her and giving her a battery-powered toy dog. Butler wrote that Jeannie could eventually tolerate fenced dogs, but that there was absolutely no progress with cats. In her journal, Butler wrote that she got Jeannie to stop attacking herself when angry and taught Jeannie to instead express, express her anger through words or by hitting objects. Butler also claimed that very soon after moving in with her, Ginny became noticeably more talkative and she made substantial progress with her language acquisition. In an early August letter to Jay Shirley, she wrote that the man she was dating had also noticed and commented on the improvement in her language. Ginny's incontinence gradually improved until, by the end of her stay, she was almost entirely continent. Jeannie's mother continued to visit Jeannie and around the time Jeannie moved in with Butler, Jeannie's mother received corrective cataract surgery which restored much of her vision. During Jeannie's stay, Butler had the man she was dating move in with her, believing that authorities would view her pending foster application more favorably if she offered a two-parent home. However, Butler began to strenuously resist visits from the researchers who she felt overtaxed Genie and began disparagingly referring to them as the Genie team, a nickname which actually stuck. Butler particularly seemed to dislike James Kent and Susan Curtis, preventing both from visiting during the later part of Genie's stay and also had several disagreements with Riegler although he later said that their disputes were never as personal or as heated as she portrayed them. Researchers believed that Butler had good intentions for Jeannie but criticized her unwillingness to work with them and thought she negatively affected Jeannie's care and the case study. They strongly contested Butler's claims of pushing Jeannie too hard contending that she enjoyed the tests and could take breaks at will, and both Curtis and Ken emphatically denied Butler's accusations towards them. The research team viewed Butler as personally troubled, noting her long-standing and widely known reputation for combativeness among co-workers and superiors. Several of the scientists, including Curtis and Howard Hansen, recalled Butler openly stating that she hoped Jeannie would make her famous and Curtis especially remembered Butler repeatedly proclaiming her intent to be the next Anne Sullivan. In mid-August, California authorities informed Butler that they rejected her application for foster custody. The extent, if any, to which Children's Hospital influenced the decision is unclear. Riegler maintained several times that even though scientists' objections Neither the hospital nor any of its staff intervened and said the authorities' decision actually surprised him. The NOVA documentary on Jeannie, however, states the rejection of Butler came partially on the hospital's recommendation. There is evidence that many hospital authorities, including Hansen, felt Butler's ability to care for Jeannie was inadequate and hospital policy forbade its staff members from becoming foster parents of its patients. 
Butler herself believed the hospital had opposed her application so Jeannie could be moved somewhere more conducive to research and wrote that Jeannie, when being told of the decision, was extremely upset and had said no, no, no. In early August, Hansen suggested to Riegler that he take custody of Jeannie if authorities rejected Butler's application and Riegler initially balked at the idea but decided to talk it over with his wife Marilyn. Marilyn had graduate training as a social worker and had just completed a graduate degree in human development and she previously worked in nursery schools and Head Start programs. The Rieglers had three teenage children of their own, which Jay Shirley later said made them consider themselves more suitable guardians for Jeannie than Butler. They, in the end, decided that if no one else would, they were willing to temporarily care for Jeannie until another suitable foster home became available. Riegler acknowledged the proposed arrangement would clearly put him in a dual relationship with her, but Children's Hospital and authorities decided that in the absence of other options, they would consent to make the Rieglers Jeannie's temporary foster parents. On the same day Jeannie went back to the hospital, the Rieglers had Jeannie transferred to their home in Los Feliz. David Riegler said that he and Marilyn initially intended the arrangement to last for a maximum of three months, but Jeannie eventually stayed with them for almost four years. When Jeannie moved in with the Rieglers, Marilyn became her teacher. David Riegler decided to take over the role of Jeannie's primary therapist from James Kent, and the research team immediately resumed observations and evaluations. The Rieglers remained Jeannie's primary caretakers throughout this time, but with the consent of Jeannie's mother and her psychologist, authorities designated John Minor as Jeannie's uncompensated legal guardian in 1972. While Jeannie lived with the Rieglers, her mother usually met with her once a week at a park or a restaurant, and their relationship continued to grow stronger. Even though the Rieglers never expressed any, any hate or dislike towards Jeannie's mother, their efforts to be polite to her came off as condescension. Years later, Marilyn also said that she was uncomfortable acting as a mother to Jeannie in her house with Jeannie's real mother present. With the exception of Jay Shirley, who later said he felt the other scientists didn't treat her as an equal, Jeannie's mother didn't get along well with the other researchers, some of whom didn't really like her because of her apathy during Jeannie's childhood. The scientists speculated that Jeannie's mother gave them a mostly cold reception because they reminded her of her, early, of her earlier inaction on behalf of her children and David Riegler also believed she was in denial about Jeannie's condition and the hand that she had in causing it. Curtis wrote that Jeannie's mother often gave conflicting statements about her married life and Jeannie's childhood, saying what she thought people wanted to hear, which the research team believed was out of fear of reprobation or ostracism for telling the truth. Jim Butler, who married shortly after authorities removed Jeannie from her house and began using her married name, Rach, stayed in touch with Jeannie's mother, Rach, Rach, I believe. Although Jeannie's mother later remembered that most of their conversations during this time were shallow in nature, they continued to get along very well. Throughout Jeannie's stay with the Rieglers, Raj persistently accused researchers of conducting harm harmful tests, deliberately forcing her mother out of her life, and misusing the available grant money, all of which the research team consistently and, em and emphatically denied. Jeannie's mother steadily began listening more to Raj and eventually came to feel the research team was marginalizing her. Without any obvious cause, Jeannie's incontinence immediately resurfaced and was especially severe for the first few weeks after she moved in but persisted at a lower level for several months. In contrast to Butler's writings, the Rieglers observed Jeannie still acted out her anger on herself and noted that certain situations in particular, such as spilling containers of liquid, sent her into tantrum behavior, which doctors attributed to her having been beaten for these actions as a child.
They also wrote that Jeannie was extremely frightened of their dog and when seeing it for the first time she immediately ran and hid. The research team recorded her speech being much more halting and hesitant than Raj had described, writing that Jeannie very rarely spoke and that for the first three months of her stay almost always used one word utterances. Unless she saw something which frightened her, both her speech and behavior exhibited a great deal of latency, often several minutes delayed for no clear reason, and she still had no reaction to temperature. She continued to have a very difficult time controlling her impulses, frequently engaging in highly antisocial and destructive behavior. Shortly after Jeannie moved in, Marilyn taught her to direct her frustrations outward by generally having a fit. Because Jeannie sought compliments on her appearance, Marilyn began to paint Jeannie's fingernails and told her she didn't look good when she scratched herself and when situations came up which especially upset Jeannie, Marilyn tried to verbally de-escalate her. Jeannie gradually gained more control over her responses and with prompting could verbally express frustration although she never entirely ceased to have tantrums or engage in self-harm and on occasion could indicate her level of anger. Depending on whether she was very angry or just frustrated, she either vigorously shook one finger or, or loosely waved her hand. Although the scientists did not yet know the reason for Ginny's fear of cats and dogs, the Wrigglers used their puppy in an effort to get her used to it and after approximately two weeks she entirely overcame her fear of their dog but she continued to be extremely afraid of unfamiliar cats and dogs. Marilyn worked with Jeannie to help overcome her ongoing difficulty with chewing and with swallowing which took around four months Although they didn't note that Jeannie didn't like going to the effort of chewing and therefore she still preferred softer food whenever possible. She also tried to help Jeannie become more attuned to her body sensations and in late 1973 Curtis recorded the first instance of Jeannie showing sensitivity to temperature. Although Jeannie deliberately did the least she possibly could in both Curtis and the Wrigler's estimation, throughout her stay her physical health substantially improved. At first Jeannie usually didn't listen to anyone unless someone directly addressed her or if Curtis played classical music on the piano and if someone spoke to her she almost never acknowledged the other person and usually just walked away after a while. In an effort to get Ginny to listen to other people, Curtis began reading children's stories to her and at first she didn't really seem to engage, but one day in mid-October 1971, Curtis saw that Ginny was clearly listening and responding to her. After that, she paid attention to people even when they were not speaking directly to or about her. She became kind of more sociable in her interactions with people and a bit more responsive even though she still quite frequently showed no obvious signs that she hurt someone. Her reactions to most stimuli became more rapid but even by the end of her stay she sometimes took several minutes before giving a response to somebody. After several months of living with the Wrigglers, Ginny's behavior and social skills improved to the point that she started going to first a nursery school and then a public school for mentally retarded children her age. Again that horrible word. The Wrigglers also taught her some basic self-help skills including simple chores such as ironing, using a sewing machine and preparing simple meals for herself. She made quite a lot of progress with controlling herself both at home and in public and although it was very hard to prevent her socially inappropriate masturbation, she had almost entirely seized it by the end of her stay. In February 1973, Curtis recorded the first time that Jeannie shared something with her and while she continued to take things from other people, her reactions when other people saw her doing so clearly indicated that she knew she was not supposed to. 
During the time that Jeannie lived with the regulars, everyone who worked with her reported that her mood significantly improved and she was clearly happy with her life. As late as June 1975, David Regler wrote that Jeannie continued to make significant strides in every field which the scientists were testing. Nonetheless, even by mid-1975, most social interactions with her remained abnormal in quality. The scientists wrote that while her overall demeanor and interactions with others was significantly improved, many aspects of her behavior remained characteristic of an unsocialized person. Curtis began thorough active testing of Ginny's language in October 1971 when she and Frumkin decided that her linguistic abilities were sufficient to yield usable results. Linguists designed their tests to measure both Ginny's vocabulary and her acquisition of various aspects of grammar, including syntax, phonology, and morphology. They also continued to observe her in everyday conversations to, to gauge what pragmatics of language she acquired. The research team considered her language acquisition to be a substantial part of their larger goal of helping her to integrate herself into society. So, although they wanted to observe what vocabulary and grammar Jeannie could learn on her own, out of a sense of obligation, they sometimes stepped in to assist her. Throughout linguist testing, the size of Ginny's vocabulary and the speed with which she expanded it continued to outstrip all anticipations. By mid-1975, she could accurately name most objects that uh, she encountered and clearly knew more words than she regularly used. By contrast, Ginny had far more difficulty with learning and using basic grammar. She clearly mastered certain principles of grammar and her receptive comprehension consistently remained significantly ahead of her production, but the rate of her grammar acquisition was far slower than normal and resulted in an unusually large disparity between her vocabulary and grammar. And grammar. In everyday conversations, Ginny typically spoke only in short sentences and inconsistently used what grammar she knew, although her use of grammar remained significantly, significantly better in imitation and her conversational competence improved during her stay but remained very low, which the scientists found unsurprising and suggested was evidence that the ability to engage in conversation was a separate skill from knowing language. In many cases, the scientists used the genie's language development to help them gauge her overall psychological state. For instance, genie consistently confused the pronouns you and me, often saying, mom, I love you, while pointing to herself, which Curtis attributed to a manifestation of genie's inability to distinguish who she was from who someone else was. The scientist especially noted that she often understood conceptual information, even if she lacked the grammar to express it, which they wrote demonstrated that she had greater cognitive abilities than most children in congruous phases of language acquisition. In some instances, learning a new aspect of, la of language played a direct role in furthering her development. At the time, Ginny learned to say, may I have, as a ritual phrase, she was also learning how to use money and Curtis wrote that his phrase gave Jeannie the ability to ask for payment and fueled her desire to make money, causing her to take a more active role in performing activities which would lead to a reward. At the start of testing, Jeannie's voice was still extremely high-pitched and soft, which linguists believed accounted for some of her abnormal expressive language and the scientists were very hard to improve it. Her voice gradually became moderately lower and louder, although it remained unusually high and soft, and she began to better articulate words. Despite this, she consistently deleted or substituted sounds, making her extremely difficult to understand. The scientists believed that Ginny was often unaware of her pronunciation, but on other occasions she produced haphologies which were clearly intentional and would only speak more clearly if formally explicitly requested to. Curtis attributed this to Ginny trying to say as little as possible and still be understood. 
Eventually, Curtis and Merlin convince Jeannie to stop attempting her most extreme haplologies, hap but she continued to delete sounds when possible, causing linguists following the case to refer to Jeannie as the great abbreviator. Papers with the case study indicated that Jeannie was learning new vocabulary and grammar throughout her entire stay with the Wrigglers and were optimistic about her potential to varying degrees. Nonetheless, even by mid-1975, there were still many pieces of language that she didn't learn. Furthermore, even though she could understand and produce longer sentences, she still primarily spoke in short phrases such as ball belong hospital. Despite the clear increase in Jeannie's conversational competence, the scientists wrote that it remained very low compared to normal people. Curtis and Frumkin, in the end, got to the conclusion that because Jeannie didn't learn a first language before the critical period ended, she was unable to fully acquire a language. Sometime during the early to mid-1972, the Wrigglers overheard Jeannie saying, Father hit big stick. Father is angry to herself. Demonstrating that she could talk about her life from before she had started to learn language. During the rest of her stay with the Wrigglers, she would constantly repeat, Father hit to herself. And before the Wrigglers worked with Jeannie to understand the concept of death, she often asked them where her father was, afraid that he would come and get her. Although she didn't speak to others about her childhood, she often gave researchers valuable new information when she did, and the scientists tried to get Jeannie to tell them as much as possible. As she learned more language, she gradually began to speak about her father and his treatment of her in greater detail. Father hit arm, big wood, Jeannie cry, not spit, father hit face, spit, father hit big stick, father is angry, Father hit Ginny big stick, father take piece wood, hit, cry, father make me cry, father is dead. In contrast to her linguistic abilities, Ginny's nonverbal communication continued to excel. She invented her own system of gestures and pantomimed certain words as she said them and also acted out events which she could not express in language. At first, she would only draw pictures if someone asked her to, but during her stay with the Wrigglers, she started to use drawings to communicate if she couldn't explain something in words. In addition to her own drawings, she often used pictures from magazines to relate to daily experiences and for reasons the scientists never determined especially did so after encountering things that frightened her. Sometimes during mid-1972, Marilyn observed that a magazine picture of a wolf sent Jeannie into a terror, after which the Wrigglers asked Jeannie's mother if she knew a possible cause for this reaction. The mother then told them that her husband acted like a dog to intimidate Jeannie, making the underlying reason for her fear clear to the scientists for the very first time. Throughout Jeannie's stay, the scientists saw how frequently and effectively she used her nonverbal skills and never determined what she did to get such strong reactions from other people. David Riegler vividly remembered an occasion when he and Jeannie passed a father and a young boy carrying a toy fire truck without speaking to each other and said that the boy suddenly turned around and gave the fire truck to Jeannie. Curtis also remembered one time when while she and Jeannie were walking and stopped at a busy intersection, she unexpectedly heard a purse emptying. She turned to see a woman stop at the intersection and get out of her car to, gi to give Jeannie a plastic purse, even though Jeannie didn't say anything. To take full advantage of her nonverbal communication abilities, in 1974, the Wrigglers arranged for her to learn a form of sign language. Starting in the fall of 1971, under the direction of Curtis, Victoria Fromkin and Stephen Creation, who was then also one of Fromkin's graduate students, linguists continued to give regular dichotic listening tests to Ginny until 1973. Their results consistently corroborated the initial findings of Ursula Bellugi and Edward Klima. Researchers therefore concluded that Ginny was acquiring language in the right hemisphere of her brain and definitively ruled out the possibility that Ginny's language lateralization was only reversed. 
due to the lack of physiological problems with Ginny's left hemisphere, they believed abnormal neurological activity in her left hemisphere, which they speculated came from her atrophied language center, blocked all language reception in her right ear, but didn't obstruct non-language sounds. Linguists also administered several brain exams specifically geared towards measuring Ginny's language comprehension. On one such test, she had no difficulty giving the correct meaning of sentences containing familiar homophones, demonstrating that her receptive comprehension was significantly better than her expressive language. Ginny also did very well at identifying rhymes. During these tests, an EEG consistently picked up more activity from the two electrodes over the right hemisphere of her brain than from those over the normal locations of the Broca's area and Wernick's area and found especially high involvement from her right anterior cerebral cortex, lending further support to the researchers' conclusion that Jeannie was using her right hemisphere to acquire language. Curtis, Fromkin and Crashen continued to measure Ginny's mental age through a variety of measures and she consistently showed an extremely high degree of scatter. She measured significantly higher on tests which didn't require language, such as the lighter scale, than she did on tests with any kind of language component, such as the verbal section of the Weschler Intelligence Scale for children and the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. In addition, throughout Ginny's stay with the Wrigglers, they tested a variety of her brain functions and her performance on different tasks. For these, they primarily used tachystoscopic tests and during 1974 and 1975, they also gave her a series of evoked response tests. As early as 1972, Ginny scored between the level of an 8-year-old and an adult on all right hemisphere tasks the scientists tested her on, and she showed extraordinarily rapid improvement on them. Her ability to piece together objects solely from tactile information was exceptionally good, and on spatial awareness tests, her scores were reportedly the highest ever recorded. Similarly, on a Mooney face test in May 1975, she had the highest score in medical literature at that time, and on a separate gestalt perception test, her extrapolated score was in the 95th percentile for adults. On several other tests involving right hemisphere tasks, her results were better than other people in equivalent phases of mental development. In 1977, the scientists measured her capacity for stereognosis at approximately the level of a typical 10-year-old, significantly higher than her estimated mental age. The scientists also noted in 1974 that Ginny seemed to be able to recognize the location she was in and was good at getting from one place to another, an ability which primarily involves the right hemisphere. Ginny's performance on these tests led the scientists to believe that her brain had lateralized and that her right hemisphere had undergone spe specialization. Because Ginny's performance was so high on such a wide variety of tasks, predominantly utilizing the right hemisphere of her brain, they concluded her exceptional abilities extended to typical right hemisphere functions in general and were not specific to any individual task. They attributed her extreme right hemisphere dominance to the fact that what very little cognitive stimulation she had received was almost entirely visual and tactile. While even this had been extremely minimal, it had been enough to start lateral lateralization in her right hemisphere and the severe imbalance in stimulation caused her right hemisphere to become extraordinarily developed. By contrast, Ginny performed significantly below average and showed much slower progress on all tests measuring predominantly left hemisphere tasks. Stephen Krashen wrote that by two years after the first examinations on her mental age, Ginny's scores on left hemisphere tasks consistently fell into the two and a half to three year old range, only showing an improvement of one and a half years. On sequential order tests, she consistently scored well below average for someone with a fully intact brain, although she did somewhat better on visual than on auditory tests. She didn't start to count until late 1972 and then only in an extremely deliberate and laborious manner. 
In January 1972, the scientists measured her in the 50th percentile for an 8.5 to 9-year-old on Raven's progressive matrices, although she was outside of the age range of the test design. Similarly, when the scientists administered Knox Cubes tests in 1973 and 1975, Ginny's score improved from the level of a 6-year-old to a 7.5-year-old more rapid than her progress with language, but significantly slower than that of right hemisphere tasks. There were a few primarily right hemisphere tasks that Ginny didn't perform well on. On one memory for design tests, she scored at a borderline level in October 1975, although she didn't make the mistakes typical of patients with brain damage. In addition, on a Benton visual retention test and an associated facial recognition test, Gini's scores were far lower than any average scores for people without brain damage. Even though this contrasted with observations of Gini in everyday situations, researchers anticipated these results. Curtis's explanation was that these tasks likely require use of both hemispheres, Previous results on the memory for design tests found a negative impact from abnormal brain function in either hemisphere and that this would therefore be very difficult for Ginny since she exclusively used her right hemisphere. After the initial grant and the one-year extension, Riegler proposed an additional three-year extension and the NIMH Grants Committee acknowledged that the study had clearly benefited Gini, but concluded that the research team had not adequately addressed their concerns. In a unanimous decision, the committee denied the extension request, cutting off further funding. In 1975, when Ginny turned 18, her mother stated that she wanted to care for her, and in mid-1975, the Rieglers decided to end their foster parenting and agreed to let Ginny move back in with her mother at her childhood home. John Minor remained Ginny's legal guardian, and the Rieglers offered to continue assisting with Ginny's care, and despite, the, and despite the grant ending, Curtis continued to conduct regular testing and observations. While living together, Ginny's mother found many of Ginny's behaviors, especially her lack of self-control, very distressing, and within a few months, the task of caring for Ginny by herself overwhelmed her. She then contacted the California Department of Health to find care for Ginny, which David Riegler said she did without his or Marilyn's knowledge, and towards the end of 1975, authorities transferred Ginny to the first of what would become a succession of foster homes. The environment in Ginny's new placement was extremely rigid and gave her far less access to her favorite objects and activities, and her caretakers rarely allowed her mother to visit. Soon after she moved in, they began to subject her to extreme physical and emotional abuse, resulting in both incontinence and constipation resurfacing and causing her to revert to her coping mechanism of silence. The incident with the strongest impact happened when they severely beat Jeannie for vomiting and told her that if she did it again, they would never let her see her mother making her terrified of opening her mouth for fear of vomiting and facing more beatings, just like her father did to her. As a result, she was extremely frightened of eating or speaking and she became extremely withdrawn and almost exclusively relied on sign language for communication, which is, sh which is such a shame. During this time, Curtis was the only person who had worked with Ginny to have regular contact with her, continuing to conduct weekly meetings to continue her testing, and she noted the extreme deterioration in Ginny's condition. She, she quickly started petitioning to have Ginny taken out of the home, but Curtis said that both she and social services had a difficult time contacting John Minor, only succeeding after several months. In late April 1977, with assistance from David Riegler, Minor removed her from this location. Because of Ginny's previous treatment, Minor and David Riegler arranged for her to stay at Children's Hospital for two weeks, where her condition moderately improved. 
Authorities then placed Jeannie in another foster home where she did fairly well, but in mid-December 1977 the arrangement very suddenly ended. Through the end of that month into early January, Jeannie lived in a temporary setting after which authorities put her in another foster home. During this time, Curtis wrote to Minor that Jeannie didn't understand the reasons she was moving and believed it was her fault for not being a good enough person and said the frequency with which her living arrangements changed, for, changed further traumatized her and caused continued developmental regression. In 1976, Curtis finished and presented her dissertation entitled Jeannie, a psycholinguistic study of a modern day wild child and academic press published it the following year. Prior to this time, Jeannie's mother thought of Jeannie and Curtis as friends, but in early 1978 she wrote that she was very offended at the title and some of the contents of Curtis's dissertation. She decided to sue Children's Hospital, her therapists, their supervisors and several of the researchers, including Curtis, Riegler, James Kent and Howard Hansen. Privately, she disputed some of the details in Curtis's dissertation of her husband's treatment of the family during Jeannie's childhood, but her official complaint did not. Instead, she asserted a violation of patient confidentiality and accused the research team of giving testing priority over Jeannie's welfare, invading Jeannie's privacy and severely overworking Jeannie. Regional media immediately picked up the lawsuit and members of the research team were shocked when they found out about it. All of the scientists named in the suit were adamant that they never coerced Jeannie, maintaining that Jeannie's mother and her lawyers grossly exaggerated the length and nature of their testing and denied any breach of confidentiality. While David Riegler was giving his deposition, he discovered that Jean Butler Rach had pushed Jeannie's mother into suing and in an interview several years later, the lawyers who worked with Jeannie's mother confirmed that Rooch heavily influenced the actions of Jeannie's mother throughout the course of the lawsuit. According to author Russ Reimer, the suit was settled in 1984. However, in 1993, David Riegler wrote, quote, the case never came to trial. It was dismissed by the Superior Court of the State of California with prejudice, meaning that because it was without substance, it can never again be refiled, end of quote. Susan Curtis said that in late December 1977, she had been asked if she could be Jeannie's legal guardian, but that after she met with Jeannie on January the 3rd, 1978, Jeannie's mother suddenly stopped allowing her and the rest of the research team to see Jeannie again, immediately ending all testing and observations. In early 1978, authorities discovered that after Jeannie turned 18 years old, John Minor failed to update his status as Jeannie's legal guardian as a minor to that of her legal guardian as an adult incapable of caring for herself. Without consulting Minor, on March 30th of that year, authorities officially transferred guardianship to her mother, who then forbade all of the scientists except Jay Shirley from seeing her or Jeannie. Jim Butler Raj remained in contact with Jeannie's mother and continued to spread negative rumors about Jeannie's condition, especially targeting Curtis, until 1986 when a stroke left her with aphasia. Raj, she died in 1988 following another stroke. From January 1978 until the early 1990s, Jeannie moved through a series of at least four additional foster homes and institutions, some of which subjected her to extreme physical abuse and harassment. Shirley saw her at her 27th birthday party in 1984 and again two years later, and in an interview years later, he said that both times Jeannie was very depressed and almost entirely uncommunicative. In 1992, Curtis told Russ Reimer that the only two updates she heard on Jeannie indicated she barely spoke and she was depressed and withdrawn. When Reimer published a two-part magazine article on Jeannie in the New Yorker in April of that year, he wrote that she lived in an institution 
and only saw her mother one weekend every month with the first edition of his 1993 book titled Genie, a Scientific Tragedy, stating this as well. The afterword of the 1994 edition of Reimer's book on Genie, written in November 1993, detailed conversations he had with Genie's mother, who had since gone blind again due to glaucoma, just before and after the publication of his magazine articles. At that time, she told him that Jeannie recently moved into a more supportive foster home which uh, allowed regular visits and said that Jeannie was happy and, although hard to understand, was significantly more verbal. Several people who worked with Jeannie, including Curtis and James Kent, harshly criticized Reimer's works. A late April 1993 New York Times review of Reimer's book from scientific reporter Natalie Ang Angler, which took an extremely negative view of the research team, prompted David Riegler to write a letter to the Times. In this letter, published in mid-June 1993, he responded to what he said were major factual errors in Angler's review and gave his first public account of his involvement in Jimmy's case. Riegler wrote that, as of his writing, Jeannie was doing well, living in a small private facility where her mother regularly visited her. He also stated that he and Marilyn were in contact with Jeannie's mother and had recently re-established contact with Jeannie, who he said had immediately recognized and greeted him and Marilyn by name and said that my wife and I have resumed our now infrequent visits with Jeannie and her mother. As of 2016, Jeannie is a ward of the state of California living in an undisclosed location in Los Angeles. In two articles published in May 2008, ABC News reported that someone who spoke to them under condition of anonymity hired a private investigator who located Jeannie in 2000. According to this investigator, she was living a simple lifestyle in a small private facility for mentally underdeveloped adults and she appeared to be happy only spoke a few words, but she could still communicate quite well in sign language. The news stories also stated that Jeannie's mother died of natural causes at the age of 87 in 2003 and featured the only public interview that Jeannie's brother, who was then living in Ohio, gave about either his or Jeannie's lives. He actually told reporters that, reporters that since leaving the Los Angeles area, he visited Jeannie and their mother only once in 1982 and refused to watch or read anything about Jeannie's life until just prior to the interview, but said he had recently heard that Jeannie was doing well. A story by journalist Rory Carroll in The Guardian, published in July 2016, reported that Jeannie still lived in state care and that her brother died in 2011, and despite repeated efforts, Susan Curtis had been unable to renew contact with Jeannie. Jeannie's is one of the best-known case studies of, of language acquisition in a child with delayed linguistic development, development outside of studies on deaf children. Susan Curtis argued that even if humans possess the innate ability to acquire language, Jeannie demonstrated the necessity of early language stimulation in the left hemisphere of the brain to start. Since Jeannie never fully acquired grammar, she provided evidence for a weaker variation of the critical period hypothesis. Jeannie's nonverbal skills were exceptionally good, which demonstrated that even nonverbal communication was fundamentally different from language. Because Jeannie's language acquisition happened in the right hemisphere of her, of her brain, its course also helped linguists in refining existing hypotheses on the capacity for right hemisphere language acquisition in people after the critical period. Since the publication of Curtis's findings, her arguments have become widely accepted in the field of linguistics. Many linguistics books have used Jeannie's case study as an example to illustrate principles of language acquisition, frequently citing it as support of Chomsky's hypothesis of language being innate to humans and of a modified version of Lenneberg's critical period hypothesis and her work with Jeannie provided the start of several additional case studies. 
In addition, the disparity between Curtis's pre- and post-1977 analysis of Gini's language has sparked debate among other linguists regarding how much grammar Gini acquired and whether she could have acquired more. As of 2011, no one directly involved in Ginny's case has responded to this controversy. The study of Ginny's brain helped scientists in refining several existing hypotheses regarding, regarding brain lateralization, especially its effect on language development. In particular, the disparity between Ginny's linguistic abilities and her competence in other aspects of human development strongly suggested there was a separation of cognition and language acquisition which was a new concept at the time. The unevenness of her ability to learn right hemisphere versus left hemisphere tasks gave the scientists valuable information about the manner in which certain brain functions develop as well as the way lateralization affects a person's ability to improve them. Ginny's difficulty with certain tasks which had been described as predominantly controlled in the right hemisphere also gave neuroscientists more insight into the processes controlling these functions. In several of their publications, the scientists acknowledged the influence that Jean-Marc Gaspard Itard's study of Victor of Aveyron had on their research and testing. Ginny's development also influenced perceptions of Victor and the case study on him. Both researchers working with Ginny and outside writers noted the influence of the historical reports of language deprivation experiments, including accounts of the language deprivation experiments of Samtik I, King James IV of Scotland, and the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. The two ABC News stories on Ginny compared her case to the Fritzel case, especially pointing out similarities between Ginny's father and Joseph Fritzel and the mental states of Ginny and Fritzel's captive three grandchildren upon entering into society. The research team and outside scientists also contrasted Ginny with a case in the 1950s of a girl known by the name Isabella whose first exposure to anyone besides her deaf non-speaking mother came at the age of six but who successfully acquired language and developed fully normal social skills within a year. Justin Leiber argued that the scientists' inability to do more for Ginny was largely out of their control and primarily the result of legal and institutional processes surrounding her placement. And this guy was, yeah, I know it was a handful and it was a lot of information, but this is. on several occasions the regulars maintained that their home had been the best available option for Ginny at the time and said that both they and everyone who worked with her believed she was doing well. They also said they genuinely loved Ginny and always provided her the best care possible, pointing out that she had made substantial progress in every aspect of her development while living with them and they and Curtis both said that Ginny's mother had prevented them from continuing to work with Ginny as they had wanted. While representing the Rigglers in court in 1977 and 1978, John Minor went out of his way to give them credit for acting as foster parents to Ginny for four years. And when Curtis spoke to Reimer in the early 1990s, she praised their work with Ginny and their willingness to take her into their home although she also said she felt they hadn't done enough when she told them about Ginny's abuse in foster care. This is such a sad case. It's, it's horrible and she made such good progress. I feel like on one hand, you know, the experimentation side of things, I don't really like it, the studying her and all these kind of things. But at the same time, if you compare how she was at the beginning when she was uh, in the hospital and how she was after they removed her from the hospital. She made a significantly great improvement and then again she kind of went back to what she experienced when she was back home with her father but in foster care this time. So it kind of shows that uh, although she did, uh, she did progress a lot, the first sign of abuse got her to devolve straight back to how she was when she was being abused by her father, which is such a shame really. And also, so I found it fascinating that you are capable of never learning a first language in certain conditions, which is quite scary, if I'm honest with you. I'm, I'm not sure what you, I'm not sure what your take is on this. I'm not sure what you took from this video, but I'm looking forward to reading your comments on this one. 
for now take care stay safe and i'll see you in the next video bye